Okay, can you please spell our name for us? Maureen, M-A-U-R-E-E-N, Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y. Okay. And first question is, how do you feel after taking a role in helping the environment, and why? Well, I'm really interested in the environmental issues, uh, basically, I think, because I started camping when I was kind of young, and you would see the environment that you were in, you would see the animals, you'd see the forest and the trees, and then it, you would hear about threats to these things, that they were going to do mining or they were going to do clear-cutting, and so that became an interest of mine. And in our local community, you know, we like to have more green space, or one of my issues was to not put a road through the marsh. And so um, I got involved in that particular project in 1988, and eventually, me along with a lot of other people, ended up having an election in our community in which the road project was turned down. So that made me feel very good that we were able to explain to people the issues, um, what the road might would do to our marsh, that how important our marsh was for people who go there because for educational purposes, for wanting to walk there to see the birds and the animals that live there, um, for our water control, um, for flooding. And so that made me feel good that that was one particular project that I could work on and could see a concrete result. Sometimes in environmental issues you don't always see a real concrete result. Uh, I'm quoting you. It's a well, in one of the articles, you said that the future of the Cross's environment is in the hands of the residents. What does that mean? Well, I think that was probably as a result of the road through the marsh issue when we were going to have um, this election. So it's really up to the people, but on any environmental issue, it's really up to the people of that area to decide what they want in their community. Um, in La Crosse, some people were saying we need to have this road, but they tended to sometimes be people who lived outside the area who wanted to be able to travel in here and, you know, get in and out quickly. And of course, those of us who live there would be the ones that would be basically impacted when um, you know, many people's houses were going to be torn down. They were going to be destroyed to put in this new road. And others of us who use the marsh, because I live about a mile and a half away from it, so I use it real regularly, it was going to be different. It was going to have this big highway through it or you know, next to mm -hmm. it and through parts of it. So um, you have to be, you as a citizen have to be responsible for what you want your community to look like and not necessarily to let other people tell you what you should want. Okay. Um, I heard in the article that you don't think we should be going to the Arctic Refuge to get oil. How do you feel after the government digs into Alaska or other places for oil? On the Alaska or on the um, Arctic Wildlife Refuge issue, there's enough oil there to apparently, um, from what I have read, help the United States with its oil needs for about six months. So that's a really a relatively s smaller amount of oil. So I think we really need to look at some other things that could save the same amount of oil. So maybe we need to get rid of some of our huge cars that get eight miles at a gallon or 10 miles or you know, tw even 20 miles because they're with um, improved electrical or engineering technology, we can actually have cars that get 40 miles in a, you know, a gallon. That would save a lot more gas for a lot longer time. Um, the Alaska Wildlife Refuge, if we drilled there, would have a severe impact upon the caribou migration and upon migration of other animals. And um, these animals can't continue to always bear the stress that we're putting upon them. So we have you know, the long-term issue of do we want to have the refuge there for, the rest, for eternity, or can we somehow figure out how to get six months of oil from someplace else? The whole oil issue is a huge issue that we're going to have to deal with. And getting oil for six months isn't going to deal with our oil dependency issue. Um. Okay, what do you think about this? I read this in your article, and it said that lacrosse prides itself on our lifestyle. What do you think of that? When people come here to recruit or to want a job here or businesses bring in people to hope to hire them, they tell them, look at the river, look at the bluff, isn't this a really beautiful place? Um, we have a lot of other things besides our environment. I mean, we have some great cultural things. We have symphony. We have you know, theaters. We have a lot of things in this community. And in maintaining our green space, Another organization that I belong to is the Mississippi Conservancy, which is buying up land, um, which is going to be open to the, which is open to the public. Um, we are trying to preserve our green space. We are trying to allow people to be able to get out into the community, see what a beautiful place it is, be able to hike, not have 
our whole area being built up with houses. Um, so our lifestyle here, I think, is we want to be a friendly community. We want to have a place where people can get out and recreate. We want to have a certain amount of cultural things, and that's what I mean by lifestyles. Okay. Um, so this would be a good time to start talking about the um, judge. Sure. Okay. Um, when you went to your dad's courtroom, do you think you learned most of judging skills from him? Most of your judging skills? I'm not a judge. I mean, lawyer. Lawyer. Um, actually, my dad was a lawyer. And um, and then he became a judge. And when I was a kid, I would go to his office. Actually, I'd go to his office after school to get money to go to the um, drugstore. Um, but I would see kind of what was going on. I didn't go to his courtroom all that often. I went a couple of different times. But um, I think he gave me the idea that I could be a lawyer. I didn't really see him be a lawyer because when I was growing up, um, women didn't get to think about being lawyers. That wasn't women weren't lawyers when I was growing up. There weren't anybody, any television shows for me to see any women lawyers. There were lawyer shows, but there weren't any women on them. Women were nurses and teachers and social workers, which are great professions, but there weren't a lot of professions. So I suspect when I got older, I thought about, ah, oh, my dad was a lawyer. I know something about that. But I didn't really, my dad died when I was really young, or I wasn't really young, but I just gotten out of law school. And so I didn't really get to see him all that much. Okay. Okay, it said in your article that you were victim to many stereo stereotypes by your clients. So what does, how do you feel about that now? Well, a lot of times it was just kind of, I never took it terribly seriously. Um, you just had to educate them. When I graduated from law school in 1975, there were not any women lawyers in La Crosse County. Um, my, another friend and I from law school came here. We were hired by different firms, but we came here at the same time, another woman. And people would get mixed up. Um, they would, actually they would confuse the two of us, say, oh, it must be the other one. Uh, so th they just weren't used to dealing with women lawyers. I had a judge who couldn't figure out what I was doing in the courtroom. I had to finally say like three times, I am the lawyer representing this client. And finally I was like, oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, there were sometimes people who were afraid to have a woman represent them because it, it was just un unknown to them, un unfamiliar. And then you were young besides, that's always a problem for younger lawyers, brand new people out of law school anyway. Um, so it's just a matter of education, hanging in there, um, not letting it get you flustered and just continue on. I never had a terrible experience where anybody said, I will not have you. Um, you know, no way will I ever let a woman represent me. Although I did have a lawyer one time say he was not re re ready to lose to a girl. That was kind of funny, especially since he lost the motion. Um. Oh. You have another question, Ben, while I think of it. Okay. Um, what influ influenced you to become a lawyer? Well, as an undergraduate, I was actually in sociology in corrections, which I wanted to be a juvenile, basically something like a juvenile probation worker. And I did some volunteer work out at Oregon School for Girls, which was the detention center where girls were placed at that time. And it was interesting, and I did like it. But then I decided I took a political science course, and it was taught like a, a law school class where we examined cases. And I just decided things were opening up. There were more opportunities. Um, I just decided I'd like to go to law school rather than be a social worker. Um, and I like going to school, so I decided I just applied and got accepted. Um, I remember that question. How do you feel now that there are a lot of women lawyers? Is that like, what kind of feeling does it make you get and why? Like, well, it's nice to have a lot of women that you can, um, you know, talk with, um, be involved in the bar association with other people, uh, men and women. Um, right now, the number of women in law school is about equal, at least in Wisconsin. So, as a group, there's still fewer women because there's not as many older women being lawyers, but there's a lot of younger women coming in, and I think it's great. It's, it's fun now. Um, what was it like running against John Derlich? Perlich. Perlich. I ran for judge two different times in the early 80s, and I was actually fairly young at that time, and in retrospect, I was in my early 30s. Um, campaigns are difficult, uh, any kind of campaign, whoever you run against. Um, because you're out there in the public, you're meeting people. That's actually where I met people who said, I don't think a woman 
is right. I, we're not ready to have a woman judge. More than being a lawyer, it was in the campaign of we don't have any women judges. I'm not ready to have a woman be a judge. And there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, all that you can do is say your spiel, say what your experience is, what you would like to do, what you would, what your proposals are, what you would think your advantages of bringing you to the bench. Um, and let the people decide. There's nothing else that you can do about it. But I think over time, and um, people get used to seeing women in those positions, they say, oh. In fact, I was going door to door um, during my campaign. And this one, I was talking to the woman, at the, the, the wife in the house. And this man came up and said, you spoke at my, one of my um, business clubs. I thought you did a really good job. I was surprised. He was giving me a compliment, but he was surprised that I did a good job. And, and that was kind of funny. OK. Okay. Do you think a judge or a lawyer needs to be connected to the community to really have an effect? I think that the judge has to be open to the community in the sense of knowing what's going on, attending activities. A judge has a fine line to walk because judges can't get too involved in certain community activities because they're going to make decisions on, on certain aspects and certain questions. So for example, judges can't get involved in community activities where they have to do fundraisers. They can't go out and collect money from people, even for very good causes, because their power and influence could make people think, oh, if I don't give to this judge, um, maybe I can't, maybe I won't do well in their courtroom if I ever go there. But um, judges can do a lot of community speaking. They can come into the classrooms. They can go to business groups. Um, so I think it's important that people explain. Um, judges are very good at, ex or can be very good at explaining how the judicial system works. And a lot of people have a lot of concerns now about the judicial system. They don't think it's fair, or they hear about a case that maybe was odd, an oddity, and the judges can explain, well, sure, once in a while, maybe there is an odd case, but here's how the normal case works. Here's what happens in our courtroom most of the time. Now, people can come to court, too. And that's another good thing, is that the judges can encourage people to go to court and watch. Because we really want our people to know about our courts. We really want people to understand how the legal system works. Because in the, it really does, in the main, work in a fair and reasonable and logical order. It's just that people need to um, be willing to spend some time to learn how it works and to understand it. Um, approximately how much time do you think you spent a week on your um, running for judge campaign? Oh boy, that was a long time ago. I probably worked, see I was still working and doing my job too, so I was actually had to give up my personal activities, which is my running marathons and doing those kinds of activities. Um, but you probably spend 20 hours a week doing that and I was still doing you know, my full-time legal work. Okay, it said that in 1983 you were the YWCA's Outstanding Professional Woman. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about getting that award? That was the first year that the YW started their, um, their awards to women. And so I was the first person that got that business award. So that was very, very flattering. Um, I mean, I was very excited about it. There was a lot of women, of course, that um, I was very proud that I was one of them and had gotten selected for that award. So that was very nice. I guess because you've asked me some environmental questions, I also, in 1993, got the environmental award for my volunteer activities within the community. I have a question. Um, do you think they started giving the awards to women because of you? The YWCA, I think, wanted to give a tribute to women as women were doing more and more things in the community. Um, they wanted to be able to recognize women for their involvement. There are a lot of organizations like the Chamber that recognize people, but those tended to be men. Not so much anymore, but back then they were more men that they were recognizing. So the, um, the YW wanted to be able to recognize women. They recognized 10, 12 women a year in different aspects. They represent a student leader, or they re recognize a student leader, um, women in education, in the environment, in um, labor, in business. Um, so in medicine, they have a, quite a wide variety of um, categories now. Um, was the night of the two wins one of the best nights of your life? Why or why not? Well, no, I didn't win the election. That was not the, uh, I'm not a judge, I'm still a lawyer. So um, I, when I ran, there were five people that ran um, 
each time actually, and I came in second. So on the one hand, you can say, oh, you did fairly well, but of course only the first person gets to be judge. So um, actually, in retrospect, of course, it's always hard to lose things or it's somewhat disappointing, but um, you still have your family and your friends and they didn't, you know, they were very supportive. All my friends were very supportive. They all worked for my election um, and they were all still my friends and I still am practicing law and in fact I'm now, you know, oh I was a partner then but I've been a partner for a long time in my law firm and so I think I've had a good and successful career and probably have met people and done things um, as a lawyer that I wouldn't have been able to do as a judge so I'm happy with what I'm doing. I have a question, um, what were your fondest memories of being a lawyer and doing your environmental work? Fondest memories? I get to think about these for a while. Actually, I mean, as a lawyer, I, th I don't know if I have any particularly one fond memory. It's nice when you feel like you've helped people. I do um, a lot of what I call people law. I don't do a lot of business law or I don't do a lot of um, you know, personal injury or accident kinds of cases. I represent individual people. So I'll do family law, which unfortunately is a lot of divorce work, but it's also helping children um, going through uh, divorces when they're families are arguing I could, as a guardian ad litem representing children. Um, so it's nice and other kinds of cases too. Um, when people buy homes, when they do adoptions, estate planning. So when you help somebody, when somebody said, oh thank you, I didn't really think it would work out this well and you really helped me or um, it was a hard case and you were there to help them through it um, and they felt that you were a support, it's really nice when clients, um, it's really nice when you get a letter. I mean sometimes you know, you don't, people say, oh, thank you, it was nice. But when you actually get a handwritten letter from someone or when they send you flowers after the case, um, then you really feel like you appreciated that, you know, it was, it, you sort of had a friendship with your client in addition to working with them. You know, in the environment, I think the best thing that I really like doing now, for the last 10 years I've been involved with this organization called the Mississippi, Mississippi Conservancy. It's called a land trust where we help people who would like to donate their land or donate um, the use of their land. They keep it, but um, they don't develop it. They give us the development rights, which means that they will never develop the land. We're working with the La Crosse, um, the city of La Crosse to get land on the top of the bluff so that we can hopefully have a long hiking corridor there. And I've been doing that for 10 years and I incorporated them, which means I did the business work of starting it. I was on the original board of directors, but there were others that were also very instrumental in starting the organization. And then I've been doing their legal work free for the last 10 years. So I can see that we've now are protecting up to about 3,000 acres. And that's probably been the ex most exciting, tangible um, thing that I've done um, that's really local that's going to have a long-term impact in the community, I hope. At one, at one point, did you feel like giving up on the race? Why or why not? I don't think I really knew so much what I was doing when I decided I was going to run for election. Um, I've been practicing about eight years, and it just seemed like I should do that. Um, my dad had been a judge, and I thought, it would, I, mean, I, I thought it would be interesting to be able to help people come to um, resolving cases. Sometimes judges help people resolve their cases. It doesn't always have to be a trial. And so I thought that that would be you know, a, a good type of thing that I could do. It's a lot of work, and frankly, it gets it very expensive. So not only do you have to um, raise money or use your own money to pay for brochures and um, television ads and um, being on the TV, but you also have to um, run around and speak to people. And then there's a person on the other side. It wouldn't be so bad running if all that you were going around and doing was talking about yourself and saying, this is what I would like to do and I hope you'll vote for me. But if you also have to hear the other person say, she wouldn't be a very good judge because she hasn't done this or she hasn't done that or I would be a better person because I've had more experience here or there. You know, that makes you nervous after a while. It's just kind of, you're tense, you're always a little bit under the gun. Um, so I don't think I was exactly wanting to quit, but I didn't realize how, probably how stressful it would be. Uh, 
thank you for coming here today. Okay. Giving us some information on you and your job and your environmental progress. Thank you for so. having me and thanks for doing this project. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Five, and then Pat Heim came um, a couple months after us. Janet and I argue over who was here first because I was hired first, but she started a week or so later because I had to be out backpacking um, on a trip. It says here that you received a grant of 1000 for the National League of Women Voters to produce a new educational video. Mm -hmm. What was that video? We did a video in, nine, I think it was like 1988 or 1989, when the uh, Marsh Coalition was first starting, and that was to be able to take out to the people, to different organizations, as to what was in the marsh and what was the threat to the marsh about the road building. Um, I think that now, you know, you school kids come through the marsh um, through the various educational environmental programs. But I was amazed when I went out speaking in um, 1988, 89, 90, did a lot of community speaking down on the marsh. How many people did not know that there were trails in the marsh? They had never, you know, they'd gone to Myrick Park Zoo, but they had never gone out into those trails. And so um, the, mar the video actually showed the trails, showed the birds, and it really showed people that, yeah, there is something there to protect. I think a lot of people just kind of thought of it for a long time as this swamp area between the north and the south sides of La Crosse. Mike, what's the latest thing you've done for the environment? Um, that, oh, yeah. that was the, um, I guess I don't see it here, but I brought a membership about the Mississippi Conservancy, and that's what I do on a real regular basis. So if I, um, in the last year or so, I have closed, meaning I've been the attorney on the real estate matters on all of the, uh, on so quite a few closings that they have where they've purchased property. It's been a 10 year project, but the last three or four years we've really been able to um, get a lot of grants from different organizations and different governmental units in fundraising and been able to buy a fair amount of land. So that's what I've been working on um, and what I'm most enthusiastic about right now. Over the years, it, of course, varies as to what the, the road issue can still come back. You know, the problem with environmental issues is that, like on the road, if somebody wants to put a road through the marsh, until that road is there, they will always be fighting for a road through the marsh. So you have to have a long-term view. You have to um, not get discouraged, not give up, realize that you may win the issue now, but you can't let up or you can't go away and not think about it anymore because someone may come back at some point and still want to do the activity that you didn't want. Um, how do you feel about the marsh now since they're building more and more around the well, marsh? Unfortunately, they keep um, picking away at the edges. So you feel, uh, fill a few acres here and a few acres there. And people always say, well, what's five acres? Or we'll, um, we'll fix it someplace else. There is a process called remediation where they um, actually make wetlands in a different area to kind of make up for what they filled. The research that I had seen and when I went to a seminar on it really is that they don't do a very good job. You can't duplicate or it's really hard to make a wetlands. Um, you, it just doesn't work that way. You can't dig a hole and make it into be a marshy area that took a long time for those um, areas to develop. So I'm saddened by that happening and I I mean, I do think that the laws have gotten more strict on that. They kind of come and go on how strictly they're enforced. Um, I think the main marsh is still, you know, it's still there. It's still good. Um, I think people just have to use it, and more, and people use it. I mean, if you've been there on weekends or on nice days, um, you'll see that a lot of pop people are there. I mean, we're rollerblading through it. We hike through it. You bird watch through it. The um, people from the Sierra Club and Audubon do uh, bird hikes through there in the early spring. So I'm happy with the marsh. I like the marsh. I think we've done a nice job on um, getting people into it. So, and the more people use something, the more they're then willing to come up and you know defend it and keep it special. You ever think the marsh will be like? You think I'll ever have something built in it, like a little store or something? I don't think they will build something like you know houses or stores or commercial. And part of that is that people do realize that you can't build on that kind of a, a substructure. You'd actually have, I mean, I think you have to sink um, platforms I and mean, it would be difficult to build on because it's kind of soft and bushy and that's why you could build a, a road better because you can put it on pilings and, and um, it's hard to 
put a house in that kind of thing. You'd also have a lot of flooding there. I think people realize that we already know that in the north side, that when you have a big you know, storm here or a big sn snowfall and then it melts, that when you get um, the, the runoff in the spring, that it floods the houses in certain areas. So that would really happen in the marsh. And we've taken pictures and you, we've used that, um, again, to talk about the marsh that in the spring when you have had a big storm or a lot of snow um, the winter before, that the marsh really fills up. And then you can say, okay, look at all this water. Where is this water going to go if it can't go in the marsh? It's going to go in somebody, you know, more people's houses, more people's basements. So I think people are realizing that, um, but they still have this conflicting, you know, I want to use, I want to do this project on the outskirts, so why can't we fill a little bit here and a little bit there? But I don't think they'll ever build anything really, but you can't pave over the marsh. I think everybody agrees that that, you know, engineering wise, construction wise, really wouldn't work. Do you think that more people should get out and experience the marsh and why? I think people should get out and, ex I think it's healthy for people to get out and walk through the marsh. Hickson Forest too. Hickson Forest and the marsh are a great combination. You can, you know, walk actually from Riverside Park to the top of the bluff or the other way around. Um, I think people need to get out there just to um, see what we have there, to realize how beautiful it is, how peaceful it is. Um, certainly walking there allows people to have some stress reliever. We, ha we all read articles about um, needing to walk more, um, so that's a very healthy thing. But I just think people would get out there, take their kids there, that they would realize how nice it is and how important it is. Well, I see that you have brought your the For the Common Good book. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is a book uh, for the Common Good, a history of women's roles in La Crosse County, 1920 to 1980. And this was a project of the League of Women Voters and Margaret Larson. And Margaret Larson, I think, is working on this project with you now. But this was a book that the um, League of Women Voters commissioned, um, I think, to preserve the history so that people will know what women were doing in La Crosse during that time period. At the end of the book, they actually kind of there's a couple pages that bring it up a little bit more to date, um, close to mid-1990s. I came all across in 1975, so my era is sort of at the end, or beginning, I'm, I'm just coming in at the tail end of the book. But um, it's, I, I think you guys have, you've, people have read parts of it. It's a really interesting book. I think it really tells us a lot um, of what's going on in the community and that we want to remember um, you know, the people's contributions that they've made in the various organizations and how one organization has flowed into another organization. Um, women's groups have always been very important in any community because that's, you know, they're the kind of people that do interested in women and children's issues. And um, so it gives a good history, I think, for people who aren't familiar with the community can kind of get a fast study on what's going on. And it's very important, to, I think, to know our history, to not forget what the goods and the bads, because sometimes history shows, you know, difficult problems that we need to continue to be aware of and think about. Are you still friends with many of the people you were with in your campaigns or helping the environment? I am. I, you know, I think anytime you're really involved in an organization or a cause, you, they become your personal friends because you do so many activities together. So the people that worked on my campaign, I'm friends with all of them, of the people that still live around here. Um, one interesting thing that you always, you know, the Marsh Coalition started out and probably half of the people who were on the original steering committee have moved away from the community, but we've had new people come in. So, it, and actually the Marsh Coalition, anytime it looks like there's going to be a serious threat to the road, a lot more people get active and join. Um, some, you know, we all have very busy lives, so it's hard to keep involved all of the time on an activity, but um, that's an organization that's near and dear to many people's hearts, or a cause that's near and dear to people's hearts. And so if it looks like the road, um, people are going to talk more seriously about the road issue again, then people get very involved and want to make sure that the coalition um, is still ongoing. Well, right now we have like an adopt the highway system. Uh huh. So do you think that it is a good cause? If you adopt the highway, we go out and clean up. Yeah. Yeah. My, my Sierra Club um, does that too, and I have to go out Tuesday night and clean up my highway. I think it is. I mean, that's another thing we can do with the for the environment, especially in the spring when you go out, you realize often how much has been thrown out during the winter. Um, I, I think it gets us back to the land, realizes that 
we need to be more careful about how we treat in our, our outdoors as our house. Um, um, yeah. okay. I was just, I'm showing you the um, bulletin for, or not the, the um, membership brochure for the Mississippi Valley Conservancy, which is a group that I've been working on most. And it's got a lot of pictures, mostly of the lacrosse area. But um, we actually work in six counties in the surrounding western Wisconsin, um, up and down the Mississippi River Valley. And um, this is hoping to preserve more lands, rivers, and bluff lands, um, farmlands, so that people will be able to go upon undeveloped lands that our wildlife will have connections so that they're not um, down to a small little area that they need to live in. And this is actually a project that's involved in Wisconsin. All uh, Many conservancies, local areas have these conservancies trying to, um, it's made up of local groups um, who want to do something special in their community to preserve the land for the future. What do you have to do to get into the Mississippi Valley Conservancy? Well, any, it's open to anybody. Um, and, you know, there's a membership. It's a membership organization, but it, they have like a student rate that's very cheap. I think like fifteen dollars. Otherwise, um, you know, the minimum is twenty-five. But we do a lot of um, hikes because we want to take people out onto the land. It's sort of like you asked me about should people go out in the marsh. Well, we want to take people out onto the land. Um, it's we have different projects in different areas: the Black River area, the La Crosse River area, the Bluffs. We have areas in. Um, Crawford County down by Ferryville. On the, it's, we're, it's really a bluff and a river in the main. Um, but we have a lot of work opportunities for people, volunteer opportunities to help um, do prairie restoration, to clean up areas that, have, that we've just purchased that need some restoration, um, fire burns uh, if you've been trained. So we do a lot of work on the land trying to restore it. So it's really kind of an interesting organization because you can support the cause. Uh, by financially being involved, um, being on boards and organizations, helping to do fundraising, or you can get out there on the land, which a lot of people do like to do, and actually um, help preserve it, restore it, bring it back to what it had been. I see here that you brought uh, a meeting slip from the Sierra Club. Right. So what is the Sierra Club? The Sierra Club is an organization that works to try and preserve the, um, the beauty of a community to help people live in healthy communities. They're doing a lot now, for example, on trying to wean us off of our energy dependency, looking at other ways of uh, providing for power, be it you know, more efficient cars, um, energy conservation, alternative energies, looking at issues dealing with toxics and pesticides because people have a lot of um, I think they have a lot more allergies and asthma than we used to have, and a lot of that is environmental, um, environmentally derived, I think. So it actually was an organization that was started in the early 1900s by John Muir, who, as a child, grew up in Wisconsin. He came from Scotland, came to Wisconsin, then he moved out to the um, California, and originally it was sort of a Sierra, as in the Sierra Mountains out there. Um, but now it's a national organization, there's an organization in Canada. And it's of people who want to um, be active in the outdoors. They have a great outings group. Um, we do outings here in La Crosse. They have outings, we have outings in Wisconsin, and they have outings nationally. I went with an organization, or with a, um, one of their groups to Mexico, and we did a hike in a canyon for a week. Um, it was a very cool, it's called Copper Canyon. It's five times bigger than the Grand Canyon. Um, so the Sierra Club has a lot of different interests because, again, it's people do the outdoors, they see, um, you know, they do the hike the Rocky Mountains, you do different things in the outdoors, you kayak, and then you're concerned about preserving the places. But also they're doing a lot of what they call urban environmentalism, that there's a lot of plants in different um, areas, oil, oil refining, different kinds of um, toxics, and people, the companies have been allowed to get away with putting a lot of bad stuff in the air, or putting a lot of bad stuff in the soil. And a lot of people that have lived in those areas have gotten pretty sick. And so Sierra Club is hooking up with a lot of neighborhood people in those kinds of communities to help clean up the air, clean up the problems, and make sure that those people's health is taken care of. Um, 
Do you ever like um go back in your like free time and read the articles often? I don't very often, um, but because you asked me to bring in some um, of some of this material, I have it in boxes. I don't throw much away, uh, or I like to keep one of everything. Um, so it was interesting to go back and you know and again and look at the pictures. Um, when I was thinking about the Marsh Coalition, that that isn't actually a wonderful example of different kinds of political activity that you can have. I mean, we used to call up our our, our um, council people and you know talk to them about if a vote was coming up on a particular issue of the marsh. We did what we call lit drops. You know, you, you do a brochure to explain to people the issues, and you go around door to door. Um, you know, we did a lot of public speaking. We actually had ads on the in the newspaper and the radio and television. So it's it's a great example of a grassroots organization, people in the community trying to get out information, trying to pass legislation. You know, we went to a lot of city council meetings, we went to a lot of committee um, committee meetings of the city council. So it's a great organization. Or if you're going to look at it from a political science point of view of how a group can try and affect um, legislation. Actually, I, was a, I started getting involved in organizations in the community a year or two after I came here, and that's when I joined the Sierra Club. And then all of these probably have kind of spun off from that or getting more involved um, in the community. The first year or two when I came here after college, I thought, I better work and figure out what I'm doing. But then after that, I got involved. Oh, and also I got involved in the League of Women Voters at that time. Um, the League of Women Voters, which is kind of a co-sponsor of your project, is an organization that wants to explain issues to people so that they understand them so that they can vote. The League of Women Voters started as an, um, as an offshoot of the suffragette movement when you know, women didn't have the right to vote, so then they had to try and get the right to vote, which was a long time and a big organization. And then the League started in 1920. That's when the League of Women Voters started nationally. Um, and so now what we do is we study issues, and some of them are environmental, some of them are social. And so that we understand what the pros and cons of an, or of an issue and, an, and then we can take positions and try and pass legislation. So I got involved probably in 1976-77 with like the League of Women Voters and the Sierra Club, um, actually the YWCA on the um, domestic violence issues and then just gotten involved since then. How many clubs are you a member to? I would have to sit and count them. It's been lots and lots and lots. Um, over the years. I've been on the Boys and Girls Club um, board. I was on the Mississippi Archaeology Board. I was a president of the Young Lawyers um, State Association. I've been active in the Bar Association also. I've been president of our local Bar Association um, on the YWCA. I've been on some state boards for different um, things, not all environmental. So I think it's important. My, my parents um, were involved in the community probably my mom more than my dad eventually. But um, I think it's important that you give back to the community, that you get good things from the community. I have a nice job. Um, and so I think it's important that I do my share, that I volunteer on different projects to try and make it a better community. I, what one of your clubs is one of your favorites? Um, well, you know, it's hard to to say what a favorite club is because it's all it also gets mixed up. Somebody asked me if I'm friends with the people. So you know you get involved with your friends who are in the club. So the League of Women Voters has been uh, where I've probably made lots and lots of friends in the org in the community. But the environmental community would be the other one. Um, as far as the cause that I'm near and dear to me right now, it's the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. But as far as making friends and and therefore being involved in a cause with my friends, it would be probably the Sierra Club and the um, League of Women Voters. Um, well, you guys have any more questions? I have one more for this. Like, how, how much people are in like, the Sierra, for example? How many people are in the Sierra? Like, in the Sierra Club, um, it's actually more than La Crosse County. It's 
it's about seven or eight counties in our area. That's how it's set. There's, there's over a million nationally, but in our organization, in our club, it's about 600. But like the Mississippi um, you know, Conservancy at this point has about four or 500 in our area. So there's a lot of environmental people that are willing to pay money to join organizations and, um, and, and contribute to the cause. A lot of people join an organization because they believe in the cause, but they can't always do a lot of work right now. They're doing something else, but they want to be sure and give some money or give their name or make sure that the organization is able to continu continue. So sometimes, you know, you can be more active in an organization um, for a year, a couple of years, and then you have to go back and do your family things for a while, and then you can come um, and get back involved again in the organization. Are any of your like close family members in some of the orgs orgs in the or clubs? <laughs> I am not from La Crosse. I came here in 1975 when I graduated from law school, so I don't have any family members other than my husband. Um, my husband is involved in um, the Mississippi Conservancy and in the Sierra Club. But um, my mother was involved in the League of Women Voters. I guess I kind of didn't think about that, that she was involved in that. My mother was always a joiner of community organizations. But all my friends belong to uh, some of the, I mean, many of my friends belong to the same organizations. Or they became my friends because we were in the organization and, and we you know, worked on causes and became good friends. Are you part of the TMA, Traffic? Management Association? Well, the TMA was something that was involved when they were the um, government, that's more of a government yeah. um, organization from different parts of the government that were working on the road project or working on a study. Um, because as part of the road project, they were looking at economic development, they were looking at recreation, transportation, and so that was made up of people from Department of Transportation and the, you know, different organizations. As part of our Marsh Coalition, we also had to go to a lot of government meetings and just hear what was going on. We were observers. We weren't participants, but we needed to keep track of what the government was doing. Um, and that was both the city, the county, and um, the state, that they would have meetings in La Crosse, and we would go and monitor them to make sure that we were you know, on track of what they were doing. This podcast is brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin, by the Coolidge at Longfellow Middle School, in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.